when economists talk about economic efficiency, we usually talk about a couple of different things. In this video, we're going to look at the Edgeworth Box, Pareto, and Caldor Hicks efficiencies. Briefly, though, mostly we talk about productive efficiency and allocative efficiency. Productive efficiency is getting the most output for the units of inputs that are being used. So, for example, we want to make sure that the marginal product of capital divided by the rental rate is equal to the marginal product of labor divided by the wage divided by the marginal product of all inputs divided by the cost of those inputs. And so we're getting the same output per dollar spent and we're maximizing our productive efficiency. For allocative efficiency, it's very similar in some regards, but we're going to be looking at a couple of different things here. So let's start with a person, Tim, who's going to consume oranges and apples, and Tim has an indifference curve. Now, Tim's utility is 3.1623 along everywhere on this indifference curve. I'm simply using the formula utility is equal to apples to the one-half times oranges to the one-half. So in this case here, apples and oranges are equally desired by Tim. And he can consume you know, whatever, anything along that indifference curve, and he's just as happy as any other point along that indifference curve. So, for example, Tim may have one orange and ten apples. He may decide to have two oranges and five apples, and he's no different. He's no, you know, neither more nor less happy as he is having ten apples and one orange. He may consume a third orange and have just 3.33 uh, apples, or go with a fourth orange and have two and a quarter apples. And we can continue this on down the line, and anywhere along these points, Tim is indifferent between any other point along this indifference curve. And so this is our indifference curve for Tim consuming, deciding between apples and oranges. Now, one thing we want to find out is, well, what's Tim's maximum point or maximum bundle of apples and oranges? Well, that's going to depend on the prices of apples and oranges. But one thing we do know is that when Tim has a lot of apples and very few oranges, Tim is willing to give up a lot of apples for an additional orange when he has a lot of apples and fewer oranges. You can imagine this if you had a bag of chocolate and somebody else had a, a soda and you wanted to have some soda, you would be willing to give up a lot of the chocolates in order to get the soda relative to if you just had one or two pieces of chocolate, you may not want to give that up. But here, Tim has a lot of apples. He has 10 apples and one orange. In order to obtain one more orange to go from one to two, he's willing to give up five apples. When he decides he would rather have a third orange, he's only willing to give up three and a third apples. A fourth orange, he's willing to only give up two and a half apples. A fifth orange, he's willing to give up only two apples. And so as we can see that as Tim is obtaining more and more oranges and giving up apples, he's willing to give up fewer and fewer apples for an additional orange. And we call that diminishing marginal rate of substitution. That how much he's willing to give up of apples for an additional orange is diminishing in the number of oranges he has. Part of that's diminishing marginal utility. The more apples I have, the less utility an additional unit gives me. Therefore, I'm willing to give up a lot of these apples for an additional orange. Or Tim is willing to give up a lot of apples for an additional orange. Now again, where's that maximum? Well, it depends on the prices of apples and oranges. Let's say that apples cost 50 cents each and oranges are $1.25. Well, we'd say oranges are two and a half times more than apples. The slope of this budget line is minus the price of oranges divided by the price of apples. So the slope of this budget line is minus two and a half. That says that in the market, if you wanted to buy an additional orange, you had to give up two and a half apples. It could be somewhere down here. Maybe Tim's budget constraint looks like this, where the price of apples is now $1.25 and the price of oranges is 50 cents. And now the ratio of the price of oranges to the price of apples is 0.4. Here you give up 0.4 apples for every additional orange you get. In that case there, Tim is going to want to consume two orange, two apples and five oranges. Because if we're saying that, that our utility function puts apples and oranges on an equal preference, then what's going to determine how much we buy is going to be based on the price. So we can take a look at this point here. Let's look at the indifference curve above the equilibrium for the two and a half for the budget constraint that's minus two and a half. And apples are now 50 cents and oranges are $1.25. Tim is willing to give up more apples for an additional orange 
than what the market requires. Again, the slope of that curve is minus two and a half. The slope of the budget constraint is minus two and a half. For every orange Tim wants, he has to give up two and a half apples. Above that point of five apples and two oranges, the indifference curve says Tim is willing to give up more than two and a half. Matter of fact, when he has 10 apples and one orange, he's willing to give up five apples for an additional orange. So Tim will go ahead and consume that additional orange. He will give up, at least he'll give up two and a half apples to get an additional orange because he'd really, he'd be willing to give up five apples, uh, 10 apples, excuse me, five apples to get an additional orange. But he only has to give up two and a half in the market. Now below that point of five apples and two oranges, notice that the indifference curve is now flatter. What it's saying is Tim is not willing to give up anything near two and a half, or he's not willing to give up up to two and a half apples for an additional orange. He's willing to give up less. And therefore, the market determines that he has to give up two and a half apples for an additional orange, but he's not willing to beyond two oranges and five apples. So Tim's maximum efficiency is to stop at five apples and two oranges, given that the price of oranges is $1.25 and the price of apples is 50 cents. Now we can look at this from Tim's perspective again and notice that it's convex to the origin, that his indifference curve is convex to the origin, and that he starts at the origin from zero and it increases as he goes up on the apple axis and increases on the orange axis. So what this means is any move to the northeast for Tim of his indifference curve is he's getting more of apples and oranges both and these are better, these are more preferred bundles of goods. So Tim's indifference curves are moving to the northeast, and therefore he's better off with each of these. Now, if you looked at this from the perspective of every time you move to a different, another difference curve, he's actually increasing in the height of that. So it's kind of like a mountain that's you're looking straight down on the mountain. Tim's utility is increasing as he moves to the northeast. Now, what if we added another person? Let's say Ann. We're going to do Ann having oranges and Ann having apples. Notice now that Ann's is going to be a little different. Ann is moving from the top down. So if we look at the apple axis for Tim, when it goes from zero and increases, that means Tim is gaining more apples, but Ann is losing apples because she's going from a higher number towards zero. And if you look at the orange axis for both Ann and Tim, Let's start with Ann. If you go from Ann, from the zero right above the A and Ann, and you go left, Ann is getting more oranges, and then look at the bottom with Tim. That means Tim is giving up oranges. He's going towards zero. So what we're going to look at is trade between Tim and Ann for oranges and apples. Now Ann has an indifference curve too. Hers now faces the other way because we've inverted basically the indifference curve map for Ann. And if Ann moves towards the uh, Tim's um, you know, towards Tim, we can see that her utility is increasing. As she gets closer and closer, if she goes further from her origin and towards Tim's origin, her utility is increasing. So now we can take a look at trade between the two. Let's say that they have a bundle here at point A, where Tim has A1 apples and Ann has A1 apples in blue. Tim has Q1 or O1 oranges and Ann has O1 oranges in blue. Ann has a lot of oranges relative to Tim. Tim has a lot of apples relative to Ann. Is there a way that they could trade that would make them both better off? And actually there is. Anywhere within this lozenge would be a more preferred move to both of them. Anywhere along those red lines, along Ann's indifference curve, let's say, Tim would be better off, but Ann would be no worse off. Or anywhere along Tim's indifference curve, Tim would be no worse off and Ann would be better off. But anywhere between those two, within that lozenge, then both are actually better off. So for example, let's say, by the way, here is our budget constraint for the two, and that's what we want to look at is their trade-off with this budget constraint. And what we know is at that point there, Tim is willing to give up far more apples to get an additional orange than what he has to give up, and Ann is willing to give up far more oranges for an additional apple than what she has to give up in the market. So there will be trade between the two. And let's say they move to this point B. Now we can see that Ann is going to be giving up oranges to obtain apples. Tim is going to be giving up apples to obtain oranges. 
and we'll see how they're both better off. Anne will now move, so Tim, Tim is getting more oranges, Anne is giving up oranges, Tim is giving up apples, Anne is getting apples, and both of them move to a higher indifference curve. Anne moves towards Tim's origin, Tim moves towards Anne's origin, and they've reduced the size of that lozenge and both are better off. Now we can even move at one more point, let's say they move here, it's along Tim's indifference curve, Tim is no worse off, Anne is going to improve her lot, Anne is going to gain more apples and give up a few oranges, Tim is going to give up apples and he's going to get more oranges, and now Anne moves to this point, and now they've maximized their allocative efficiency of apples and oranges, they can't do any better than this point here. Any movement from this point here makes one of them better off and the other one worse off, so this is the best they can do. Now we can look at this from a different perspective. Let's look at Ann's utility on the x-axis, Tim's utility on the y-axis, and here is their maximum utility that both can get. And let's say they start here at A. This would be, you know, some point A with some allocation of resources where Ann's utility is A1, Tim's utility is T1, and they want to make themselves better off. And they can do this, they can maximize their utility by simply moving to the northeast. And what we're going to see is called Pareto efficiency is any move that takes us in that northeast direction. It doesn't have to be on the red curve now, but it anywhere towards that red curve, one is made at least no worse off while the other one is made better off, and we'd consider that an efficient move or an efficient change in circumstances. So for example, we could see that they move to point B. Ann's utility increases to A2, Tim's utility increases a lot to T2, and now they're better off, both are better off, and they can't do any better than this here. If they actually moved anywhere along that curve, one of them would be better off while the other one would be worse off. So we say that this is a Pareto efficient move. Anywhere, any move in that northeast quadrant may, is what we call a Pareto efficient move because one person is made better off and the other is made no worse off. And so going from A to B is a Pareto efficient move. On the other hand, if we went from, say, A to C, that would not be, because although Ann is better off, Tim is made worse off, so that would not be a Pareto efficient move. And therefore, we wouldn't be finding that, you know, Tim would never have agreed to that move. Now, there is one way to look at this. We could say, let's say Ann gains $1,000 and Tim loses 100 That's why Ann's utility increased a lot and Tim's utility didn't increase that much. Well, what if, say, Ann was able to give Tim $200, and now they move to this point here? Tim is better off by 100. He was worse off by 100 before. Ann gave him 200, and now he's better off by 100. Ann gets eight, has, now has 800. This could be a Pareto efficient move. So what we're going to look at is what's called Caldor-Hicks efficiency. Caldor Hicks efficiency said a movement from A to C is Caldor Hicks efficient if conceivably Ann could pay Tim off and Tim would be better off and Ann would be no worse off. And that's what you see here. Now with Caldor Hicks, we don't require the payoff. We just say, are the gains to Ann great enough to more than offset the losses to Tim? Then we will allow that change to happen. So C would be what's considered Caldor Hicks efficient although it would not be what we term Pareto efficient. For Pareto efficiency, at least one person has to be better off and the other no worse off in order for a move to be Pareto efficient or Pareto superior. In the Caldor-Hicks criterion, you only need to have one party so much better off than the other one is made worse off that they could conceivably compensate the other for their loss. But in this case here, we don't require it. That's the end of this one. We will look at a Another one with uh, political efficiency.